By the end of 1974, the band had been voted Best Live Act by readers of Britain's tabloid Sun newspaper. By September, their contracts with Trident had become restrictive, and having signed a new contract with John Reed, went on to work on one of their most ambitious singles to date, a seven-minute Freddie Mercury composition called Bohemian Rhapsody. The song that really blew me away, which I'm sure it, it did to everybody, was Bohemian Rhapsody. And it was almost operatic, and coming from the classical world of ballet and opera, which I only knew then, I thought this is integrating the two together. Um, and it was fascinating, the great voices they had as well, especially Freddie's, of course. It was, it, he could have almost sung an opera if he wanted to. We, we went to see Freddie in the studio, um, um, the Roundhouse studio. And he was thrilled, you know, I, I bothered to turn up. And the guys were really sweet. And um, Freddie said, no, I, want you to, I want you to play. It's not finished yet, but I want you to hear it. And I, we were the first two people to hear bow rap outside the, the band. Um, <laughs> you know, because it was so long, they were worried, of course, that nobody was going to play it. Of, you know, air time. And I just thought, no, you know, I, I told them not to do anything to just absolutely keep it as it, however long it was, just keep it. People will play what they want, don't do a shortened version. So I think EMI were trying to convince them to do that. Bohemian Rhapsody had to, happened to be, uh, it was basically like three songs that I wanted to put out and I just put the three together. Right. And then it had a very big risk factor, yes. A sort of, the radios didn't really like it initially because it was too long and, and the record company said, you know, you can't market it that way. And um, after me having virtually put the three songs together, they wanted me to sort of slice it up again. I just said, look, it's either going to be, you know, a minor hit or it's going to be just enormous, I mean, because it's so incredibly different. And I think maybe you might have something really good on your hands. It was the most bizarre piece of music. It was like, obviously, the operatic feeling was coming through by then. What on earth? I still don't know what it's about. I still don't know what this collection of words is. It's almost like, you know, cutting up phrases and sticking them in. But I mean, by then, and you can hear a lot of echoes of Bohemian Rhapsody in a lot of earlier Queen tracks. You can feel them now with the, with the benefit of hindsight. You can, you can feel them. That's what they were edging towards. And the main difference between Queen and any other rock band is the operatic, the operatic feel and the fact that they use their voices as a choir, as an instrument. But the reason Bohemian Rhapsody is such an amazing song, you can listen to it now and it's still valid in 2004. It's got all these different styles. The, vo the, the vocal midsection notwithstanding, which hasn't been done since, to that standard and that musical standard. Um, it's the beginning, the beginning bit before the piano, da -da 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 -da, is all Freddie Mercury. Roger and Brian aren't singing on that. It's all Freddie. That's why it's just gives you goosebumps before the melody even comes in. So the first time you hear it, you have no idea what's going on. The first time I ever heard it, probably like most people, was uh, the video on top of the pops. The impact that that had, and they were using techniques which were new to television with the revolving images. And in fact, for a while, every director of Top of the Pops could not resist having these revolving images because it was like, obviously, the new toy to play with. Um, but if you think Queen, you think Bohemian Rhapsody, you immediately think of those revolving Im images. You can't help it. And but he said, I've got this idea for a song. And he sort of sat down and sort of started playing the song. And, and it was all going along good. And he sort of, you know, he had some words missing and some bits of melodies still hadn't quite worked out. But it was just a basic framework of the song. Then he said he was playing away and he stopped and said, now, dears, this is where the opera section comes in. I went, oh, my God. <laughs> it's what every songwriter should aspire to, whatever any, anybody thinks of Queen. If you could write a song that can stand in the same room as Bohemian Rhapsody, you're on the right track. The vocal harmonies in the middle, the cadence, da -da 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 -do 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 -do, don't worry about the lyrics, they don't mean a thing. Da -da 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 -do 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 that. That, that had never been done before. That's 
10 overdubs at least a time. Duh, 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 duh. Roy Thomas Baker has to have some hand in it for the production side of it, but the whole thing was Freddie Mercury. The whole thing had it in his head, in its entirety, before he even took it to the band, apparently. That's when, the, you know, darling, this is when the Galileos come in. That's that classic, that classic phrase from that time. But um, it's got the best, it sums up why Queen are so good. The vocal harmonies, the amazing melody, the arrangements, the guitar, of course, the head-banging bit in the back of the car and Wayne's World, you know, that's amongst the heaviest stuff that the Queen had ever done. The iconic solo, the little bit at the end, just playing, da -da -da -da, nothing really matters to me. Fantastic. It's just, it is the best song in it that's ever been written. It just is. Bohemian Rhapsody climbed rapidly to number one. And by Boxing Day, Queen had their first British number one album. Meanwhile, the Queen touring machine rolled relentlessly on. What one has to realise is that in the early days, Freddie was not the front man, it was Brian. You know, Freddie was on the piano, kind of like occasionally getting up and, you know, that's it. And it really wasn't until, um, when they were, were touring with um, A Night of the Opera, that Fred came forward as the front man. And this is what began to happen in their first American tour. And um, I just thought, you know, when you've got this amazing track, I mean, this amazing song, uh, which was, you know, doing really well in the States at the time, you know, it's just a wonderful thing to see, you know, performed live. I mean, how were they going to do it? That was what the amazing thing is. Yes, it was number one here, because, but how do you do that live? And they did it so well. I mean, you know, it was so clever. So I was at home in Plymouth, and um, I just turned on the TV. I think it was New Year's Eve. And um, it was a concert they were doing from Hammersmith. And I saw this guy, Freddie Mercury, in this white clownish makeup and this long black hair, and thought, that's outrageous. I'd never seen a band behave quite so off the wall in theatrical terms, which, of course, I was with the Royal Ballet at the time. And, and he was in tights as well, I think. And I'd, I thought, God, this is a departure from the normal pop group. And um, so that's what interested me, first of all, as well as the music. And it's just left a lasting impression on me all my life. I think he was wearing all white or something. And, of course, the music as well. And even the technicalities of the stage presentation I think that's what also made them really quite famous was that they were doing bizarre things with their shows and um, mostly at this period people were just going on with their the rest of the band you know and jamming away which was great but he made it a whole like a ballet theatrical experience I like to be entertained and that's what I liked about entertainment and the taking over like you know when Freddie goes away and, and 